Jeremy, for that uh, very kind introduction and that great uh, dinner that we had uh, about an hour ago. And uh, thanks in advance to uh, Randy Galuza for being nice to me. You are going to be nice to me, right? Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out. And uh, as somebody who has come from uh, Boston, I would like to thank whoever arranged this nice weather that always seems to be here no matter when I uh, come, whether it's February or September. Uh, coming here uh, for this event has a wonderfully nostalgic uh, quality to it. Uh, I grew up reading books by uh, Henry Morris, Dwayne Gish, Tom Barnes, Gary Parker, who I understand is here, I met on uh, Saturday, uh, and the other uh, patriarchs of young earth creationism. Uh, every month I got Acts and Facts and devoured it eagerly. I still have a big box of them in my office. As a teenager, I read the Genesis Flood from cover to cover and was profoundly impressed by its articulate synthesis of science and the Bible. I'm certain that I had the only copy of the book in my rural village of Bath, New Brunswick, Canada, just over the border from Maine in the midst of the potato fields. When the time came to go to college, I was quite excited to apply to Christian Heritage College, now San Diego Christian, I understand, sent away for a catalog and began to dream about studying uh, there under my heroes. Uh, as it turned out, I decided to attend a Christian college in Boston where my beloved Red Sox played rather than the city that hosted the Padres. Uh, <laughs> San Diego, as you see, is as far from New Brunswick as you can get and still be in the continental United States, and that was just much too far for a country boy. Uh, but while at college, I pursued my dream of becoming uh, a creationist. Uh, I attended an amazing debate at Boston University and watched uh, Dwayne Gish absolutely mopped the floor with his poorly prepared opponents. Uh, it was such an embarrassing performance that during the Q&A afterwards, some more senior evolutionists from the biology department there tried to commandeer the microphone and had to be shouted down by the audience that all agreed that uh, Gish had won the debate. I attended a workshop run by Henry Morris and finally got to meet my hero. He signed my well-worn copy of his classic text many infallible proofs and encouraged me to get my PhD in physics and then contact him about coming to work for ICR when I was all done and it was my expectation that those circumstances would eventually lead me to this very location. But as you can see by noting that I am on the wrong side of the podium, I got here by a different path. Uh, my book, Saving Darwin, How to Be a Christian and Believe in Evolution tells this story in more detail and you can uh, get it at the back uh, afterwards if you want. The topic for tonight is did God use evolution, biblical creation versus theistic evolution? The question is not is God the creator and certainly not does God exist. Our conversation tonight is about how God brought this wonderful world into existence. Was it spoken into existence a few thousand years ago with its many marvelous life forms fully formed? Or did it originate billions of years ago in a Big Bang that led eventually to solar systems like our own with habitable planets on which life and eventually our species could flourish? Because Randy and I both agree that God is the creator, rejecting any particular notion of creation is not a rejection of God, a negative statement. It is a positive statement that God created some other way. Ordering salmon in a restaurant need not be construed as an assault on the swordfish. So here is my strategy for making my case uh, tonight for uh, theistic evolution, which I understand to be the view that God's creative work takes place within the natural order, through the laws of nature, using the mechanisms that science has uncovered. From the Big Bang to our big brains, the unfolding story of origins is a narrative of God's ongoing creativity. So first I would like to establish that the scientific story of our origins is reliable. The most powerful argument supporting the reliability of science is not its ability to account for this or that observation, for there are often multiple explanations. There were three different models for the solar system at the time of Galileo, Aristotle's model, Copernicus' model, and Tycho Brahe's model. All three explained the observation that the sun rose in the morning. Newton's explanation eventually won the day, and it did so because it made startling predictions that turned out to be accurate. 
So my first point is going to be that the ability to derive novel predictions from scientific theories and have them confirmed by observation has historically been the most powerful argument for the truth of those hypotheses and theories. I will quickly mention some examples here to make the case that our origins theories from the Big Bang to the origin of the human race are reliable according to this criterion. I'll make the secondary point that biblical creation does not explain those phenomena uh, quite so well. My second point is going to be that no key theological concept is seriously damaged by evolution and in fact there are some theological puzzles some theological puzzles that are uh, actually uh, solved or at least mitigated uh, by evolution. We're all familiar with the perennial puzzle that was the basis of the infamous query launched by Clarence Darrow at William Jennings Bryan in Dayton, where did Mrs. Cain come from? But there are many other more interesting ones and I will mention uh, a few. Uh, and I want to uh, you know, actually make the case that uh, theistic evolution in this sense uh, actually can be viewed as theologically preferable because of some of these problems uh, that it uh, solves. And when all is said and done, I want to conclude with a few remarks that suggest that this view has grandeur, that this is a wonderful view of the way that God created and not one that we should view as dishonoring to our belief in God as uh, creator. And I want to get through all of that in 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, so let me start at the beginning uh, with the Big Bang. The Big Bang begins before anybody has any notion of the Big Bang. It begins in a surprising way in 1915 when Albert Einstein develops his theory of general relativity. It was a theory that was intended to help us understand gravity better. It turned out, as he worked on his theory, he discovered that it was possible to develop models for what the universe as a whole might be like. And in examining his theory, he identified three interesting predictions that it made. The most interesting of these predictions was that starlight actually would not travel in straight lines, but would actually bend as it goes through space when it passed through a massive body like our sun. So he made a prediction that during an eclipse when the stars would be out in the middle of the day and the sun was overhead that a certain distant star if observed carefully would be observed to be in a different location. Now this was a startling and odd prediction of a new theory by a physicist who was just becoming well known uh, considered to be very strange and not taken seriously. But amazingly in 1919 during an eclipse uh, Sir Arthur Eddington measured the displacement of the star and it turned out to be exactly as Einstein had predicted. Now it is very hard to imagine how the theory of general relativity could successfully make such a strange prediction if this was not an accurate description of the way the universe behaves. The New York Times ran a tall headline saying lights all askew in the heavens uh, which was great hyperbole when all that had been measured was one star moved ever so slightly from its usual uh, position. Once the theory of general relativity had been confirmed by this startling observation, people began to take it more seriously. And they discovered, and this was something that Einstein uh, was quite alarmed at, that the theory predicted that the universe should either be expanding or contracting. The universe could not be static. There had to be some kind of large scale change in its size. Einstein was so disturbed by this that he wanted to figure out a way to modify his theory to get rid of this problem. Now this is an interesting example where a theory is telling its founder something that he doesn't believe is true and so he's trying to figure out how to get around that problem. Remarkably however in 1927 when Edwin Hubble was doing a map of the galaxies he discovered that the galaxies were all moving away from each other and that the further away they were from each other the faster they were moving. There's only one explanation for this and that is that the universe is expanding. The theory of general relativity somehow knew that the universe was expanding even though Einstein could not quite bring himself to believe that. If the universe is expanding now that means if we run it in reverse it has to be getting smaller. If we run backwards in time it gets smaller and smaller and seems to contract to a point. 
1933, less than a decade after Hubble's observations, a Belgian priest proposed that perhaps the universe began in some sort of an explosion. Because he was a priest and known to be a believer in the Genesis creation story, he was accused by his colleagues of smuggling the Christian doctrine of creation into physics. And he said, no, I'm simply following the evidence where it leads. The universe, he said, must have originated in some kind of a big eruption. Now, how would one determine that such an eruption had occurred? Lemaitre had absolutely no idea. In 1948, a Russian physicist uh, named George Gamow, who had emigrated to the United States to flee uh, Stalinism, was examining this theory of George Lemaitre's that nobody was paying any attention to. And he said, well, if there had been such an explosion a long time ago, there would be radiation. All explosions give off radiation. And somehow this radiation would have to still be in the universe because there is no uh, windows, of course, uh, through which it might escape. So he analyzed the uh, theory as best he could, and he published a prediction and said that the universe should be filled with a certain type of unusual, very weak radiation, and he determined the pattern to have the form that you see on the screen here, which is basically a graph that shows how much of each color of radiation uh, there should be. Nobody had any idea how to measure this, but it was a prediction that came from a theory. In 1965, two scientists working at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey in the good old days when there was only one phone company. Uh, if you're uh, younger than 40 years old, you can't remember that, but uh, once upon a time there was a common ancestor to all of the existing phone companies called uh, Bell Telephone. And two scientists that were working for the phone company built a gigantic radio receiver pictured here and started scanning the heavens to see what they might find that was interesting. They had no interest in the Big Bang, were not familiar with uh, these uh, observations. They were interested in communications technology. And what they found was a very unusual radiation pattern that seemed to be coming from everywhere. And they puzzled and puzzled and puzzled to try to figure out where it was coming from. At one point, they decided that it was uh, weak radiation coming from uh, some pigeons that had taken up residence in their telescope and deposited what they called a white dielectric substance uh, throughout the interior. Uh, but they cleaned that all out and the signal was still there uh, coming from the heavens, from between the stars, from rich galaxies, from spots of empty space. Uh, so they began to do, as any good scientist would, chart in detail the characteristics of this radiation. You can see the uh, prediction here that George Gamow had made, and as they began to chart this uh, radiation pattern, they found that their data was an absolutely perfect match for this uh, prediction. And it's extremely difficult to figure out how such a prediction could be made with such astonishing accuracy unless this is uh, actually the way the world is. So in the story, as we move forward from the Big Bang, the, this and many other uh, successful predictions undergirds the central scientific explanations for the evolution of our universe. This is why we believe the universe originated uh, in a Big Bang, because such unusual predictions have been made uh, and confirmed. And now we have a remarkable story that takes us from the moment of the Big Bang, which we still don't understand, and brings us forward uh, through periods where galaxies are formed, where stars and planets are formed, where solar systems like the Earth are formed, where solar systems that have planets that with water on them uh, exist, and all of that is preparatory for the possibility of there being life on Earth. We believe, according to the evolutionary scenario, that something like four billion years ago that life originated uh, on Earth and then began to evolve uh, via natural selection. This is a theory supported by many different lines of evidence, uh, suggesting that life originated in a very, very simple form, uh, ev evolved by making copies of itself, copies which were not perfect duplicates, and so in some cases they were actually uh, superior to uh, their parents. Uh, multicellular life uh, formed from this, and then multicellular life began the branching process that gives us the, the rich tree of life uh, that we see uh, today. 
And there are multiple lines of evidence uh, supporting this, but I want to look at the kinds of predictions that we can get if this is indeed the history of life on our planet. So one uh, such prediction that we can uh, make is that the fossil record, as we understand it, should show increasingly complex species developing over time. Human fossils should be found only in very recent strata, and they should never be found, for example, with dinosaurs. And it turns out that as the fossil record has gotten richer and richer and richer with more and more discoveries, this is exactly what we find. Steadily growing complexity as we rise through the fossil record from the oldest rocks to the newest ones. We find absolutely no mammals of any sort in the oldest layers. We find no human fossils until recently, and we find absolutely no humans ever uh, fossilized with dinosaurs, suggesting that they lived at, in vastly separated uh, epochs. Evolution makes the prediction that there should be very curious transitional forms. The way that evolution uh, brings new species into existence is by modifying existing species. And there are many examples uh, of these transitional forms. In a certain sense, every species is transitional between one that came uh, before it and one that came after. But there are some which are particularly interesting. Uh, I want to mention just one that I think is astonishingly uh, interesting because it was predicted in advance and then discovered. And I want you to kind of think about how the theory could successfully predict this if the uh, theory was not a description of the way things actually are. Uh, so the prediction uh, dealt with uh, mammals that swim. Mammals that swim use a different motion than fish, even though they might look a lot like fish and sometimes be mistaken uh, for them. Uh, mammals uh, swim with their spines moving up and down instead of back and forth. And this is more characteristic of the way uh, animals on land behave rather than animals in the water. In fact, it's, it's better if you have to swim that your uh, spine moves back and forth uh, horizontally rather than vertically uh, so you don't bang your stomach on the bottom of the pond quite so often. Uh, so there was a speculation that the water mammals must have originated from land, but there was no transitional species to make this anything other than uh, a speculation. So uh, a analysis was done, and a creature known as uh, Ambulocetus, the swimming whale that walks, uh, was outlined, and uh, paleontologists began to look for fossils of it. Um, based on an analysis of where this transition would have occurred and when it would have occurred. And in 1994, uh, sure enough, uh, this was found. Uh, the species that is very intermediate between a clearly uh, land mammal and a water mammal, able to uh, function effectively in both uh, in environments. Uh, it's a remarkable confirmation. Now, there are many such uh, examples as this, but I just want to uh, suggest that these are important indicators of the reliability of uh, the theory of biological evolution. Now, let me make a comment uh, now that brings us a little closer to some of the uh, discussion of how creationism and uh, theistic evolution might uh, compare to each other. Uh, evolution makes a prediction that we should find regularly in nature common design rather than custom design. Common design, I want to argue, uh, is driven by limited resources. Limited resources that lead to the cutting of corners. Common design is a hallmark of imperfection because of these compromises. Custom design is the hallmark of perfection. Now, Many people uh, like to claim that God functions as a common designer, so we should expect to find common design. Uh, but that's very misleading because a creator with unlimited resources has no reason whatsoever to reuse body parts or other patterns in nature uh, unless they are absolutely uh, optimum. And in many cases, we find that they are not. Uh, so if you just think from your own experience, if you look at the uh, mansion that you can see here on the left side of the screen, uh, this is a custom design. It had an architect and a lot of resources were poured into this. You can imagine that this is exactly the way the homeowner wanted it. It fits perfectly on the lot 
and so on. Uh, on the right, you can be pretty sure that no architect ever worked on the design of that uh, simple basic uh, box, uh, which is very common, and there are thousands of other houses that look exactly like it. That's what we see when we talk about common design. Now, when we look at uh, nature, we find not custom design, but common design. And we find in this common design uh, many things which are adapted in ways that don't look optimal. So here's one uh, example, that mammals have uh, five fingers at the end of their hand. If you've never counted yours, hold them up now and check and you'll see that's uh, true. Uh, cats, whales, and bats also have uh, appendages with something akin to five fingers uh, at the end, uh, even though they do very different things with, uh, with their fingers. Uh, the bat has long skinny ones over which is stretched a thin membrane to fly. Uh, the whale has uh, a fin. Uh, the cat has his uh, paw and so on. Uh, and if you look at this design, you can, you can see that uh, this does not appear to be optimal from an engineering point of view. Uh, this, this appears to be something that was adapted and changed and pushed in various directions by natural selection uh, as nature uh, used resources at hand rather than uh, starting from scratch. Now, uh, one example I think that uh, highlights just how non-optimal this process can be uh, is the evolution of, uh, uh, of the horse. Uh, here's the uh, fossil history uh, of the horse going from a small animal uh, millions of years ago to, uh, to our present horse. And we can see that over this long history, we have the uh, five fingers at the end of uh, each foot uh, changing uh, dramatically. And you can see that over time, what's happening is that uh, nature through natural selection is slowly turning a hand into a hoof and the lateral digits are getting smaller and smaller and smaller as you go through time until you can see where they've shrunk almost out of existence uh, in the modern uh, horse. Uh, now, it's hard to understand why there would need to be sort of evidence for sort of five lateral digits on a horse when there's only one uh, that's being uh, used as a part of its uh, normal uh, horsiness. The, uh, Theory of evolution predicts that we should share genes with our ancestors. We certainly know that we share them uh, with our parents, but theory of evolution predicts that we would share them with species from which Homo sapien uh, evolved uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Now it turns out, as uh, is well known, uh, that our DNA is almost identical to that of uh, chimps and bonobos. Now our DNA is uh, identical in more ways than the purely functional. It's, it's identical in ways that it doesn't need to be identical. So uh, the, the blueprint to create the eye and the chimp and the eye and the human being uh, has more similarities than, than there needs to be, which strongly suggests uh, common ancestry for those uh, genes. But what is more interesting, I think, is the fact that we share uh, some rare broken genes with other species. And it's very hard to figure out if all of these higher primates were individually, specially created, why God would have placed the same identical broken gene uh, in each one of them. Now, because natural selection can't punch reset and begin again, okay, natural selection is like an editor who has to work with an existing manuscript and can't just erase the whole thing uh, and start from scratch. So that creates constraints. These constraints lead to the prediction that evolution will have puzzling and curious ways sometimes of accomplishing goals using existing materials. And I want to give you uh, two here that I think are uh, kind of provocative related to uh, our species. Uh, it's not unheard of for human beings to have uh, webbed toes and webbed feet. Now this is very curious why we would have uh, webbing there. Uh, it's not unheard of for babies to be born with functioning and well-formed uh, tails. Now why is this? Well, uh, it turns out that we have genes to produce tails and webbed feet and webbed hands. Now, why is this? Why do we have genes to produce such features only to have them removed? 
Well, it turns out that the way that natural selection figured out to give us these particular hands and uh, toes that I won't show you uh, is that we, in the womb, go through a period where we have webbing and then there's a genetic message that's supposed to arrive on time that says dissolve the webbing uh, and get rid of it. And if the shutdown part doesn't work properly, then a baby can be born uh, with the tail uh, and with the webbing. Now it's hard to understand in a creationist model why these genes would exist and create these uh, odd uh, challenges uh, for uh, probably mostly for the parents of the uh, babies that are born. Okay, uh, I can continue on that line, but I, I want to raise a, uh, another topic now and suggest that I think we can view evolution in some ways as a friend to faith, not something that has to be viewed as an implacably hostile enemy. And I want to suggest that in the areas of uh, cruelty and bad design that evolution helps address some problems that are more challenging uh, within the uh, creationist model. So in the uh, case of cruelty, uh, the two examples I'm going to use, very simple uh, and, and they're actually ones that, that bothered Charles Darwin a lot. Uh, through most of his life Charles Darwin uh, believed in God and he wrestled with his uh, theory and its ideas. Uh, in the context of a belief in that God was a creator. Uh, and one of the things that bothered Darwin was the way that uh, cats torture mice before they eat them. Uh, now if we set aside that it's okay to be uh, carnivorous and uh, not everybody has to be a vegan, uh, we won't address that question, but if a, a cat is going to eat a mouse uh, in order to survive, why does it torture the mouse before it eats it? Why does it uh, throw it up and down, bash it, in the head, play with it endlessly, seemingly delighting in this. Now this of course is very delightful when the kitten's doing this with the tennis ball in the living room, but when mama's doing it with the mouse outside in the, uh, in the barnyard, it's not quite, uh, not quite so pleasant. Did God create cats with an instinct to torture the dinner before they ate it? Another example that bothered Darwin, uh, largely I think because it grossed him out, was a particular species of wasp that lays uh, its eggs in a very interesting way. It uh, tunnels uh, into the body of a caterpillar that's inside a tree and then it shoots its eggs into the body of the caterpillar where uh, protected from every imaginable sort of uh, predator uh, the eggs hatch inside uh, the caterpillar and the little uh, baby ichnomonidae wasps uh, come out inside the caterpillar and they eat the internal organs of the caterpillar uh, to stay alive. But not only do they eat the internal organs, they eat them in the specific order that keeps their host alive as long as possible, uh, which means they are programmed with this particular instinct, not just to eat, but to eat intelligently. Now, uh, in a, a creation model, we are forced to somehow imagine that, that God conceptualized this particular scenario uh, and said, uh, let it be like this. And Darwin felt that, uh, that this was not worthy uh, of the uh, biblical creator. If we look at the uh, question of uh, bad design, we have to confront the fact that uh, from a purely engineering point of view, and I say this with knowledge that Randy is indeed an engineer, so perhaps I'll be in big trouble for using this example, but uh, we have uh, bad design uh, in nature. Uh, one example with which probably everybody in this room is familiar is that when you uh, eat and drink it can sometimes, as we say, go down the wrong hole. Uh, and this is a design flaw that we have uh, which means that when we are eating and drinking and breathing we have uh, valves that have to open and close in just the right way. And If that doesn't work just right we can get something stuck in our windpipe and we can die uh, because of that. Uh, Heimlich is very famous for coming up with that maneuver that uh, saves life, but hundreds of thousands of people have, have died from this uh, design flaw uh, in our species. Now, uh, when we look at this we can say, well, a, uh, an engineer working uh, for General Motors could have designed a, a robot that wouldn't have this problem. Uh, why did God create it in this particular way? And my guess is if you look at this chart, various of you in this room can say, oh yes, I understand that uh, there are problems that we have with uh, knees and varicose veins. 
uh, slip disks, uh, and so on. Uh, but the uh, windpipe problem, I think, is the most, uh, the most interesting because it would have been very simple to have done that, uh, done that differently. So uh, with the theory of evolution, we have a possible way to sort of mitigate these problems, that we understand that God creates through the natural order in a way that is incarnational, working through systems that are in place, uh, and this means that there is risk involved in such uh, methods of creation, and through this risk we have, uh, we have imperfection. Now, let me make a comment about a couple of the uh, theological issues which I think loom large in this conversation. Uh, one of the most powerful and engaging parts of the Genesis story of creation is the fact that we are created in the image of God, and uh, much uh, ink has been uh, spilled trying to figure out exactly what we mean by the image of God. So I'm not going to try to tell you what I think the image means. I'm just going to say that I believe that I am created in the image of God and that uh, all of you and Randy are all created in the image of God. Uh, but how do we get the image of God? Well, theistic evolution simply calls us to believe that God brought these things into existence over a period of time rather than suddenly. That's really all we are being uh, asked to believe. So I want to suggest that there's no uh, serious theological problem if we suppose that the image of God is something which could emerge gradually that it could be present in some sort of a prototypical or incipient form uh, in simpler species and then emerges to full flower uh, in our species. I want to suggest that we have an analogy with that, perhaps with human development, uh, that perhaps we can imagine that the uh, image of God is not fully present in a newly fertilized egg but emerges through the process of uh, development and then at some later time uh, is fully uh, present. So. Uh, in a way that's perhaps analogous to that, I think we can say that the image of God can be something which arose in our species over time. Sin, of course, is another uh, big problem. The only Christian doctrine that G.K. Chesterton says is actually uh, empirically verified by science. Uh, theistic evolution simply calls us to believe that our sinful natures arose gradually, not all at once in a sudden event. Now in the same sort of a way we can suggest and certainly we can see by empirically observing other species uh, that sinful type behavior uh, seems to emerge at least in a prototypical form uh, in simpler species and then comes to full flower uh, in our species. And again I make the same analogy with the development of an embryo that well, we don't think of uh, a one-month-old uh, infant is uh, committing uh, serious sins, uh, but it, before too long we begin to train them and try to uh, wean them off of that sort of behavior, uh, and at some point we consider them to be totally responsible for their actions and fully capable of committing sin. So in that same way that our sinful nature can arise uh, slowly, I think it, the same thing can happen in, uh, in evolution. So, uh, so that's, that's the package of ideas that I think sort of commend evolution to us uh, as something which matches the observations that we see in the natural world, that makes successful predictions, that uh, reduces some of the challenges that biblical creation has to confront, uh, and possibly can also accommodate some of the more uh, significant doctrines uh, that we get out of the early uh, parts of Genesis. So I want to uh, finish by just taking a few minutes and, and describe how as a, uh, as a physicist, as a scientist, as somebody who uh, greatly respects the scientific story of origins, how I look at the world and see it as a grand narrative. Oftentimes those who would uh, have us disbelieve in evolution or the Big Bang choose to describe it in language that makes it sound so terrible that even if it was true we don't want uh, to believe in it. This is a, uh, a rhetorical exercise. and So, so I, I want to suggest that uh, the universe that has been disclosed through our modern scientific theories of origins is extraordinary and certainly worthy of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Uh, 
So let me comment uh, first as a physicist, which is my uh, field uh, by training, although I have uh, departed a lot from that. Uh, as a physicist, I stand in awe when I think that the universe began as this set of equations. That's really all that's there in the very beginning. These equations that are going to guide the universe through billions of years of change. This change is going to be remarkably orderly. And as I argue in my uh, book that's on the table outside, The Wonder of the Universe, these, these equations have to be tuned in exactly the right way to make life. I created this little figure here that I call the Acme Handy Dandy Universe Maker uh, to kind of illustrate this. That uh, it's, it's like there's a whole set of knobs in the universe and you have to adjust these knobs and you've got to adjust knobs that tell us how strong gravity should be and whether there should be two types of charge or three, uh, whether the universe should start out expanding fast or slow, whether the conservation of energy should be a law uh, or a statistical generalization, uh, those sorts of things. Now, if you change those things, if you make those fundamental features of the universe a little bit different, the result is a universe that can't have life in it. There is ample design uh, in our universe showing that there's enormous intelligence. It does not look random. It does not look uh, like some sort of crazy, disorganized explosion. It looks like a marvelous, marvelous mathematical symphony. This big bang that comes across from whatever gave birth uh, to the universe, is still out of reach. We don't, we don't understand it. It's tantalizingly beyond our grasp. But we can kind of look back and see almost all the way. But we're kind of like Moses looking into the promised land, but not getting uh, to enter. But we do see what emerges from the Big Bang. And we see uh, that after the universe begins we have processes that kick in in a most orderly way as if they are moving inexorably and surely forward to give us the remarkable universe that we live in uh, today. We have atoms and molecules as the first uh, particles uh, in the universe. These are the building blocks of everything that exists from stars to people. These atoms are endlessly recycled. They can be used again and again with no deterioration of any sort. And this is an extraordinary feature of our universe. A hydrogen atom freely floating in space 10 billion years ago can journey to Earth on the asteroid that drove the dinosaurs to extinction 70 million years ago. That same atom can be a part of Moses' physical makeup. That atom could be in the vinegar that was offered to Jesus on the cross and in the rain that fell during the Crusades. And today it can be in a cloud outside if you ever have clouds outside in San Diego. Uh, I mean, it's absolutely amazing, this extraordinary recycling ability uh, that the universe possesses. Gravity begins to gather these early atoms together into great clouds, pulling them, tugging them slowly over the course of hundreds of millions of years. These hydrogen atoms are gathered into gigantic spherical clouds, and at a certain point when these clouds become dense enough, they ignite like a match being drawn across a rough surface and bursting into flame. At a certain point, stars begin to appear in the universe. This is an amazing period. An absolutely dark universe suddenly explodes like the sky over Boston on July the 4th when we go crazy with illegal fireworks uh, there. Gravity has made these stars so dense that they begin to fuse and nuclear energy provides light. And this nuclear energy also provides the capacity to take hydrogen and build the periodic table from it, a universe which has almost no heavy elements of any sort consisting of hydrogen and helium begins to generate lithium and beryllium and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and all those lovely atoms that you learned on the beloved periodic table that hung at the front of the general chemistry classroom. Uh, the periodic table is constructed inside these stars through this fusion process. And these are the atoms that eventually will be so important for life. Some of the very largest stars die by exploding. These are called supernovas. And we see them every few centuries. When these supernovas explode, they spread their atoms over vast regions of space. They take these important, heavy, essential to life atoms and they make them available to be recycled into something else. Our solar system is just such a recycled supernova. 
Our sun is a second generation star and all of the raw material on our planet was once inside one of these supernovas and gravity gathered it into the glorious sphere on which we stand today. Some planets are exactly the right distance from the sun and they can have liquid water on them. Liquid water is so rare in the universe that were you to catalog all of the things in the universe, you wouldn't bother to even list it. But it's plentiful on our planet because of exactly where we are in between a place where it's too hot for there to be water and too cold. Liquid water provides the environment where we believe that life arose and life arises in its great diversity and it seems like the process of evolution just delights in exploring absolutely gorgeous creatures that live in the most interesting imaginable ways. This process eventually leads to creatures that have eyes and so for the very first time in the history of the universe something can see what's going on. There are ears for the first time that can hear something that's going on. These are extraordinary events and we should not diminish them just because natural processes made them possible. Life becomes increasingly more complicated and our thinking capacities get concentrated into brains and these brains begin to move creatures in very interesting directions making it possible for there to be very very high level emotions that we can begin to identify with. Mysteriously these brains are capable of doing so much more than what it seems they need to be able to do and eventually these brains created our unique species and I am thankful for this. Here's my contribution to this species, uh, my pride and my joy, pride on the left, joy on the right. Uh, brains have made it possible for us to have relationships of the sort of depth that make it possible for us to love our children, our parents, and God the way that we do. Brains have made it possible for us to be religious, to penetrate beyond the superficial layers of our experience, to kind of see that there's something transcendent and wonderful beneath and beyond and above all of this. And our faith, our religion is what we have created, what we've been inspired to do by God to show recognition. And in the understanding of our species, in the faith that we have developed, we come to understand that our species needs to love each other. And we look at the long history of life on our planet and it looks like in so many ways that this long evolutionary process has been steadily nurturing the capacity for there to be greater and greater forms of love. So many things that happened to species that lived before us, to species that we share the planet with, and to our species seem to have moved us in a direction where we need to love our children, where we need to love each other, uh, and where, as a Christian, I would say, we need to love God. So, the story of how God created the heavens and the earth, I think is a grand story, no matter how we look at it. And I want to suggest that theistic evolution has its own unique grandeur. It is a incarnational view and I want to emphasize that, that in the same way that when the scriptures were produced, they were produced incarnationally by human authors through whom God worked. When God became incarnate in Jesus Christ, he became incarnate within the human species. And when God created life on this planet, he did so within the laws that have been disclosed through our scientific processes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for the invitation tonight, and thank you, Dr. Dyerson, for agreeing to the debate. I really don't have an uh, interesting story like he did of growing up and dreaming of Dr. Gish and Dr. Morris. In fact, I just grew up in a uh, regular home. I was a non-believer. I was a non-believer most of my life until I got into high school. But I did believe in one thing. I believed in evolution with all of my heart at that time. 
I believed what my teachers told me, and I took their word verbatim. And I wasn't a believer until actually I graduated from high school from the witness of a faithful young woman who told me what I needed to know about Jesus Christ. And I'm kind of embarrassed to say that it wasn't my conversion experience, it wasn't the fact that I was born again that led me to even question evolution. It was actually the scientific evidence that led me to question evolution as I began to see lots of inconsistencies between science and not the Bible, but between science and evolution. And I really saw that there was a major conflict between science and evolution as I would, was taught it and how I understood it through high school and college. And I also saw a lot of inconsistencies between how science was supposed to operate as I was taught it as a young man and how science was being practiced in the evolutionary worldview. So my change is very, very different than Dr. Guyberson's. It was actually the science that led me to reject evolutionary thinking right from the beginning, which leads to a really important question. And that is that as science is based on, ooh, it looks like we still have a little problem here. Stop the thing for a second. I want to make sure we can, is that, um, it's getting cut off right here. We, we have to end this for just a second. Oh, Dr. Guyberson, he was up here sneaking around on my computer. Uh, okay, let's go. Yep. Once they change the, it is. It is on the screen there. Yep. Okay. Oh, whoa. Talk about um, bad design at times. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Microsoft is a study in that at times, every now and then. However, science is based on observation, testing, and repetition. And you know, there's really good support for that. The National Academy of Sciences in their anti-creation book says scientific investigators must seek to understand natural phenomenon through observation and experimentation. And so when I'm talking about science tonight, I'm talking about those things which are based on observation and testing. And you'll notice up on the screen, there's a tiny little icon there. As I go through my talk, I'm going to make four little sub points about the scientific method and why evolution fails scientific validity. So when you see those come up, I'll be making those little sub points. And then as I talk about evolution tonight, I would like to use what the National Academy of Sciences their definition of it, which is that the diversity of life on Earth is the outcome of evolution, an unpredictable and natural process of descent with modification, which is essentially what Dr. Guyberson also confirmed. But I'm not talking about just simple changes. I'm actually talking about something which will explain the diversity of life on Earth. And there are three important pillars for evolution. First is the natural origin of life. As the Academy restates, a long path leads from life from the origins of primitive life, which existed three and a half billion years ago, to the profusion and diversity of life that exists today. This path is best understood as the product of evolution. And so that is a really important point for evolutionary thinking right there. Second is the universal common ancestor, that concept that we all descended from one universal common ancestor with descent and slight modification, as Dr. Guyberson explained so well, and then third, one which we don't really think of, but that nature explains life's design, that over long periods of time, stresses and problems in the environment have shaped life, shaped your hand, for instance, and shaped all of the design that we see in life. In fact, Jerry Coyne, a full professor at the University of Chicago, says, life on Earth evolved gradually, beginning with one primitive species, and then it branched off over time, throwing off many new and diverse species. And the process producing the illusion of design in organisms is natural selection. So based on those three things, we don't really see a big need for God in all of this process. And that is why eminent evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould was able to summarize this whole evolutionary process very candidly. He says the radicalism of natural selection lies in its power to dethrone some of the deepest and most traditional comforts of Western thought particularly the notion of nature's benevolence and order and good design with humans at a sensible summit of power and excellence and proves the existence of an omnipotent 
and benevolent creator who loves us most of all. To these beliefs, Darwinian evolution, natural selection presents the most contrary position imaginable. Only one causal force produces evolutionary change in Darwin's world, the unconscious struggle of individual organisms to promote their own personal reproductive success, nothing else and nothing higher. And because this is believed so true, our host tonight, even Dr. Gish, has this book, Letter to Theistic Evolutionist, and he quotes a prominent atheist based on this conclusion of Stephen Jay Gould's, and this is what he says, a man named Richard Bozarth. Evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, Christianity is nothing. So immediately we see a major conflict between theological positions and the evolutionary thought. But then the question comes up, well, maybe theistic evolutionists can save that. Well, Dr. Guyberson's book, Saving Darwin, quotes a prominent theistic evolutionist, Dr. Francis Collins. And he has another candid assessment, so we need to read what he says in his book. Many American citizens have faith in science and technology to solve society's problems, but many others have faith in a literal interpretation of the book of Genesis, which probably encompasses most of us here tonight. And this is the conflict that is utterly in conflict with what science tells us about our own origins. He goes on to say, given such oddities in our DNA record as pseudogenes, which Dr. Guyberson talked about, ancestral chromosome fusions, special creation of humans simply cannot be embraced by those familiar with the data unless they wish to postulate a God who intentionally placed misleading clues in our own DNA to test our faith. He says, alternatives to evolution such as young or old earth creationism, intelligent design find almost no support in the scientific community. Although many non-scientific Christians have been taught to embrace one or another of these alternatives as a means of opposing the perception that evolution is godless, the God of all truth is not served by lies, no matter how noble the intentions of those who spread them. Whoa. What we see here in this quote is no ability to give the words of Scripture their normal interpretation, meaning you give their words their normal meaning in their normal context. We see here a denial of a special creation of mankind, a special creation of Adam and Eve. We see here a rejection of almost any other explanation. Young Earth creationism is out. Intelligent design is out. Even old Earth creationism is out. And all that we're left with is just plain evolutionary explanations, no different than Stephen Jay Gould's, period. And then, of course, on top of all of this, Dr. Collins wants to seem to take the, the moral high ground, as it were, in having a civil discourse about this by letting us know that those who don't agree with him are God-dishonoring liars, even though they have noble intentions. And so we see a major conflict right from the very beginning. And the conflict is this. Is it going to be man's word or God's word which is going to guide? Now, as we turn to the scriptures, we know 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And, of course, that is a circular argument, as Dr. Guyberson would pull out, but it certainly cannot be true if we cannot understand what the Bible says. And, you know, there are a lot of people in the scriptures who gave the words of scripture their normal meaning in the normal context. Isaiah did, Peter did, Paul did, and even the Lord Jesus Christ did which leads to three really profound problems that we have come up with right away. First, the Lord Jesus Christ quotes Genesis 1 and 2 as normal history in explaining the views about marriage. Now, was he wrong? Was he deluded? How can he really be the son of God if he is a liar, if he is a lunatic and confused? He certainly cannot be Lord of all. Second, Romans 5, 12, and 1 Corinthians 15 
ties the reality of a real Adam to our real redemption. It says in Romans 5.12, For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Paul goes on to say that those who are in Adam have all died, but blessed, those who are in Christ shall all be made alive. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he says that the first Adam was a, was a real death bringer, but it is the second Adam who is the life giver. Now, I certainly get passionate about this, and you should too, because these are really important things of the faith, and it is that second Adam who conquered the grave, who rose from the dead, and who will raise all of us back to life again someday in the future, which is a supernatural event. And you want to know something, brothers and sisters? An event which is scientifically proven beyond a shadow of a doubt is that dead people don't come back to life again. And yet we're not going to believe what the scientists tell us on that because it is a supernatural event. And then finally, only Genesis 3 really gives a rational explanation to explain why there are those atrocities and suffering and things that Dr. Guy Persini even mentioned. That it is a result of sin. It is not God's doing. It is our doing. It is your doing and it is my doing as we all contribute to the sin burden of this world. It was not intended by him. And yet the theistic evolutionist really cannot answer this charge rather than just saying it just is because the atheist will come up to them and say, why does he allow the suffering? Why does he allow that caterpillar to be eaten? Is your God just indifferent and he doesn't care? Or is he totally impotent and cannot do anything about it? The theistic evolutionist doesn't really have an answer to that, but we have a rational explanation. We give a reason why there are these atrocities and death. So brothers and sisters, there really is a conflict and it really is important right from the beginning. And there is no doubt about it. It really is the book of Genesis versus not science, but evolutionary teaching. And is it going to be man's thinking, which is going to stand in judgment of God's word? Or is it going to be God's word, which will stand in judgment of man's thinking? Now, from the theistic evolutionary worldview, the, the whole reason not to believe, whoa, there's a dip, whole reason not to believe in this is because of the supposed profound evidence supporting evolution. And I'm going to suggest to you that the evidence really isn't that profound. So let's take these on one at a time, first of all, looking at a natural origin of life. And we're going to do something different in this debate tonight. I'm going to hold up a scriptural claim, which we don't really do. I'm going to contrast it with the evolutionary claim, and then we'll just see what science says. First, in regard to the origin of life, the Bible clearly says that life only comes from pre-existing life. And in fact, as you turn to the book of Genesis, verse 21, it says, God created this life. And specifically, the Lord Jesus Christ says that this life resides in God himself because he says, for as the Father has life in himself, he is the essence of this life, so he has given the Son to have life in himself. And you can search the scriptures from cover to cover. You're never going to find it explain a natural origin of life. And following right on the heels of that is another interesting explanation. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? We all know that. It was just as a fancy way of saying, what in the world is the origin of reproduction? Now, I bet you don't think that the Bible talks about reproduction, but it does. In fact, it does right in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, and you don't even get over to verse 11 before someone is coming up to God and saying, God, where do puppies come from? Where do they come from? And of course, what we hope as fathers, the children went up to mom and asked them, where do babies come from? And let mom explain that. But everybody always wants to know, where do these things come from? And believe it or not, in verse 11, you have a biological statement whose seed is in itself. Is that not biological? He certainly is, and God is answering a really important question. What is this origin of reproduction? The Bible says that the ability, the genetic information whose seed must have always existed with the cellular apparatus to do it. 
And it's always going to predict some all or nothing unity in the scriptures so that any type of life, whether it's bacteria or human beings or even this little fly right here, if you were to look inside right there, you would see two tiny little fly ovaries, fallopian tubes, and a teeny weeny tiny little uterus. Now, that was worth the price of admission right there just to see <laughs> that picture on that but whose seed is in itself and reproductive capacity has always been innate to organisms. Of course, evolution says that life originally came from non-living materials. They have to say that. And it has to be a natural process only, or material process only, which Dr. Guyberson seemed to explain at the end of his talk there. Now, look at this quote by Scott Todd published in Nature just a few years ago. Even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. Now that was one of those problems with science that I was telling you about because as I was growing up, I was taught that scientists were supposed to follow the evidence wherever it leads. But I began to see statements like this which don't seem to follow the evidence wherever it leads. They're constrained to a naturalistic explanation. And so they come up with natural explanations like the Miller-Urey experiment where supposedly some self-replicating molecules came together or maybe it was some metabolic process. The scientists really don't know, but they assert that it was a totally naturalistic process. Which takes us to one of our problems with evolution not being scientifically valid, and this is particularly for the young people. As you hear evolutionary explanations, I would like you to categorize them in four areas. First. There are always appeals to events that have never been observed, totally outside the realm of observation and testing. But in terms of the natural origin of life, Scientific American reported just a few years ago this interesting article on a conference of origin of life researchers, and it says this, Psst, don't tell the creationists, but scientists don't have a clue of how life began. Whoa. Don't tell those creationists because we're on, a, on an objective search for truth, you know. But that's a pretty much slam dunk that they don't have a clue. So in terms of what is the origin of life, we know scientifically from all observational experience that life only comes from life, no exceptions. And there are no undisputed documented accounts of a natural origin of life. And you can say this with total confidence to your friends. There is not a single scientific paper published anywhere on this planet by any leading research institution which documents by experimental evidence a natural origin of life. And that is true. And so on this point, the scripture was totally right. Life only comes from life and the genetics always exist within the cellular apparatus whose seed was in itself. So I'd ask you a question. Why would evolutionary scientists believe something where all observations, all observations in science are totally contradictory? Well, that takes us to the second problem with evolution not being scientifically valid. There are always appeals to mystifying and counterintuitive explanations because of their bias and their worldview. Richard Lewontin, a famous Harvard geneticist, said this. We take the side of science, and of course he means evolutionary science, in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept material explanations of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, we are forced by a prior adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations no matter how counterintuitive and no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute for we cannot let a divine foot in the door. Now, I know all of you are keying on that last phrase, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door, but the really important sentence is this, we accept explanations which are counterintuitive and mystifying to the uninitiated. And we should not like that. 
As an engineer, I never accepted those. And as a medical doctor, I never was satisfied with those. And we should not be either satisfied with those kinds of explanations. Now, the second major point of evolution is the universal common ancestor. And it's basically phrased like this. Since parents and offspring are similar but not identical, are there limits to change? In other words, can you take all the little variety of these cute little puppy dogs right up there on the screen and given enough time, will you be able to get one <laughs> that can do something like that? Well, the Bible gives us a pretty good answer to that. Right in Genesis chapter 1, organisms reproduce after their kind. Genesis 1, 11, and 12. I bet you didn't realize there were so many biological statements right in Genesis 1 where he is giving these tremendous answers. Lots of variety, different species, but organisms always reproducing after their kind. That's a great question. And the take-home message from Genesis 1 is this. Life is fundamentally discontinuous. There isn't that universal common ancestor. There are common ancestors like Adam and Eve for all of us, but not a universal common ancestor. And that's the biblical message. Of course, evolution says this, that the diversity of life on earth is the result of evolution. And they point to this glorious tree of life right here in which life begins about three and a half billion years ago and evolves over long periods of time until you get to the diversity of life on earth. Now, you couldn't have two more contrary explanations. Life is fundamentally continuous, and life is fundamentally discontinuous. That's pretty much the way it is. Well, let's see what science says in regard to the universal common ancestor plus unlimited change. This. If you go to the laboratory and you look at the percentage of experience, experiments is showing that organisms have changed into a fundamentally different kind, that's what you get. 0%. And the number of experiments which show that an organism has never changed into a fundamentally different kind, 100% in all observational science. Even experiments that have tried deliberately to change organisms have failed. 100% fundamentally same kind. And in 2009, on Dar Darwin's birthday, this scientific paper was published a 50,000 generation salute to Charles Darwin on the longest running experiment on evolution in the world for over 35 years. Richard Lenski has been taking E. coli bacteria, taking 90% out, destroying them, growing the next 10% for a day, day after day after day. And after 50,000 generations, they had this salute to Charles Darwin. As I read the paper, I wondered what the salute was for. Because after 50,000 generations, these E. coli bacteria were what? Still E. coli bacteria. Hadn't changed. And you know who wants this experiment to continue to go until the Lord returns? I do. I do. Because I'm going to make one of two predictions. One, these bacteria are going to go extinct through mutational meltdown. Or two, when you get to the five millionth generation, there's still going to be E. coli bacteria confirming over and over again that organisms reproduce after their kind and always have reproduced. Even when you look in the fossil record, it shows the creatures have always reproduced after their kind. You look at this shrimp, allegedly 360 million years ago, essentially identical to a, fossil, to a creature living today. You know, I could really turn the knife on this because I could actually throw up dozens and dozens of photographs of creatures of their fossils and the living counterpart, and they look virtually identical, confirming this biblical truth that organisms reproduce after their kind. So this is what we really find. We find a huge diversity of organisms on this planet, and all of these connecting lines are just nothing but imaginative speculation. And there are lots of lines of evidence which are going to contradict this, which led new scientists to, to publish in 2009 this article, Darwin was wrong, cutting down the tree of life. And I'm going to hit it with even some more evidence as we go on through this constructive. So on this point, 
The Bible was absolutely right again. Life always reproduces after its kind. No observable exceptions to this whatsoever. Well, what about, what about all of these other books on evolution? What about the other evidences for evolution which we might encounter, such as the dramatic changes that are possible, like those differences in finch beaks or the different coat color on mice living in different environments or even antibiotic resistance? Well, this takes us to the third reason why ev evolution is not scientifically valid. There are always, and listen for them carefully, always appeals to extrapolations far, far, far beyond what the evidence will bear. Changes in coat colors, is it going to explain the diversity of life on Earth from fleas and bees and trees and me's and all of those other kinds of things? That's a far extrapolation. So all of the evidence for evolution falls into these categories right there. Francis Aiello, who used to be the president of the Academy of Sciences, wrote this book, Darwin's Gift to Science and Religion. He summarizes a lot of these evidences on one page. And he says this, the embryos of humans and other non-aquatic vertebrates exhibit gill slits. Human embryos also exhibit by the fourth week a well-defined tail, persisting only as a rudiment in the adult coccyx. Embryotic rudiments are inconsistent with claims of intelligent design. A familiar rudimentary organ is the appendix. The human appendix is a functionless vestige that argues against creation by intelligent design. And you see it presented in textbooks to your kids just like this. Well, very quickly, let me push back on some of those. You look at that drawing of that little embryo there and you see those little folds and grooves around its neck that they call gill slits. Never have been gill slits, never are gill slits, never have gill material in them. Sometimes children are even born with rudiments of those and have never had gill slits. In fact, they're going to develop into some important organs in your neck and your lower jaw. And what about that tail that you see up there? That tail, well, let me explain that. As baby is developing in mom's womb, the background, the backbone is put down first. And then baby grows into that backbone. So that very tip that you see there, baby's gonna grow into that and that is not a vestigial organ, that coccyx. In fact, as my good friend Frank Shern would say, if Dr. Ayala believes that's a vestigial organ, ICR will pay to have that surgically removed for him, but we won't pay for his diapers that he'll need for the rest of his life as he loses total bowel control. Not a vestigial organ, and all of you here are thankful that you have it and it's working right now. So, <laughs> that is important. <laughs> someone sitting next to someone who's glad, okay, all right. And what about that appendix right there? Supposedly a vestigial useless organ, well, just in 2013, pretty useful. Appendix evolved more than 30 times. And this is what this paper says. The researchers compiled information on the diets of 361 mammals, including 50 species now considered to have an appendix. Catch this. And they plotted the data on a mammalian evolutionary tree. They found that the 50 species are so scat are scattered so widely across the tree, meaning they don't fit the evolutionary story, that the structure must have evolved independently at least 32 times. Wow, doesn't fit the tree, so we force it into a what? Counterintuitive and mystifying explanation, right off the bat. Well, so much for those evidences. Well, here's a dear man who was telling me one time, Randy, if you ever debate Dr. Carl Guyberson, at Shadow Mountain Church someday, you be sure to tell that audience that, you know, that we have fossils of all kinds of invertebrates, and we have fossils of billions of, billions of fossils of fish, and you realize we have billions of fossils of the invertebrates and billions of fossils of the fish, and there should therefore be billions and billions, you can hear Dr. Gish saying this, of intermediate forms, but there isn't a single one of them. And then he would probably say something like this, 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, he always said that, there is not a shred of evidence that evolution has ever taken place on this planet because it can't have happened without leaving a single evolutionary form from invertebrates to the fish. Wow. You know what? His argument still stands to this day. In fact, it's summarized by the eminent evolutionist Ernst Mayer in his definitive book, What Evolution Is. Read this. Given the fact of evolution, one would expect the, the fossils to document a gradual steady change from one ancestral forms to descendants. But this is not what the paleontologist finds. Instead, he or she finds gaps in just about every phyletic series. Amazing. New types often appear quite suddenly. Amazing. And their immediate ancestors are absent in the earlier geologic strata. The discovery of unbroken series of species changing gradually into descending species is rare. Indeed, the fossil record is one of discontinuities. You know, you would almost think a creationist wrote this. <laughs> Seemingly documenting jumps and saltations from one type of organism to a different type. This raises a puzzling question. Why does the fossil record fail to reflect the gradual change one would expect from evolution? Maybe we shouldn't start with given the fact of evolution. Maybe this should drive our interpretation unless we're given to counterintuitive and mystifying explanations. Which then takes us then to the fossil record, this appearance of living things. Well, the Bible says that organisms were created fully functional on days three, five, and six of creation. They should show up fully functional, fully complex. Of course, Evolution says this, that the major differences should arrive after millions of years of evolution during which, as Darwin said, the number of intermediates and transitional links should have been inconceivably great, which we already found out you don't find. But what does science say in regard to the appearance of living creatures in the fossil record? Evolution predicts this, that you should see a slow, gradual rise starting from similar types branching out over long, long periods of time to the numerous different diverse types in body plans over time and evolution. But what we actually find is at the lowest layers, we find the individual body plans showing up already. In other words, they appear first and Darwin's tree of life is actually turned totally on its head. In fact, if you look at the major body plans, such as worms, spudges, clams, and vertebrates and stuff like that, you find this many appearing in the Cambrian record with their ancestors, zero. And you find this many out of the 47 documented filings showing up without any ancestors, 40 out of 47 appear out of nowhere, right in the fossil record. So on this point again, the Bible prevails. The appearance of life of all major life forms is this, and these are the words we should keep in mind. It's abrupt, it's discontinuous, it's extensive, and it shows up right from the beginning with mind-staggering complexity, right from the very beginning. And what about those similarities? I mean, why else would you have similar bones in the arm of a human a bat, a dog, or a frog, unless they evolve from a common ancestor. But this brings us to the fourth reason why evolution is scientifically invalid. Appeals to circularity. You interpret the data in an evolutionary context, and guess what? Voila! It comes out as evidence for evolution. Well, of course it would. I mean, why do we have these similar bones? It's because we have a common ancestor. And what is the evidence for a common ancestor? Similar bones. And I would suggest to you, listen carefully to all evolutionary arguments. I haven't found a one which isn't circular in nature. Appeals to events that have never been observed, appeals to mystifying explanation, appeals to extrapolations far beyond what the evidence will bear, and appeals to interpretations which are based on nothing but circular reasoning. But you know what? A lot of organisms have similar features which shouldn't have a common ancestor. Do you realize bats and whales 
have the exact same gene for echolocation? And as I read through the scientific paper, they said they were astounded that random genetic mutations had hit on the exact same genetic sequence down to the, slide, down to the base. And it was just an amazing thing. And if, if you were to just look at that gene, bats and whales would pair together in an evolutionary tree. And they said, of course, but that isn't their real evolutionary cousins. So it doesn't fit the tree again. So how do they explain this? Through convergent evolution, not divergent from a common ancestor, but separate things converging on the same features. But do you know what convergent evolution is? It's a rhetorical rescuing device to salvage evidence which doesn't fit the evolutionary tree and force it into an evolutionary context. It's not something that's really there that you really see in any ways. So how in the world do we know whether these similar features are due to a common ancestor or convergence? And why should we believe any of those explanations, either one of those? But what about those similarities in DNA? No, this is, this is a fascinating part. This is totally new. The Bible says common design, as Dr. Guyverson mentioned. And we begin with these prepositions that life is designed, as in Romans 1, life is discontinuous, and we're sharing this planet together. And so, just as in man-made things, you see a similar function, similar design, with similar plans, tools, materials, and environment, we would see the same thing with God-made things. Similar functions, for similar to have a similar design. Not just between that man and that woman that you see there, but between that horse. And that's actually a picture of me running a marathon last week. And, <laughs> and me, right there. Why do we have these similar features? This is great. In 1975, before we even had this great genetic sequencing capability, Dr. Henry Morris wrote, in the creation model, the same similarities are predicted on the basis of a common purposeful designer. We're looking for that common information that's going to underline the common design. From the evolutionary worldview, though, they have this tree of life. And this is what's amazing because you're not going to hear this in the evolutionary story today. Ernst Mayer explained in 1963 much has been learned about gene physiology that makes it evident that the search for similar, the homologous genes, is quite futile except in close relatives. So evolution did not predict these similarities before we could look back. In fact, they said, because organisms have been evolving and the mutations have been happening, these creatures and these creatures, these diverse creatures, should have very, very different genetics. So here's a great opportunity. Before we have a way to test it, creationists made a prediction, evolutionists made a prediction. Two very different predictions. And what does the science say? Well, between 1978 and 1984, some phenomenal groundbreaking papers were published in which they analyzed genes which were coding for, incredibly, almost entire structures, such as an eye. And these genes were called Hox genes. Well, evolutionary developmental biologist Sean Carroll reports on it this way. He said, it was inescapable. Clusters of Hox genes shaped the development of animals as different as flies and mice. And now we know that includes just about every animal in the kingdom, including humans and elephants. The implications were what? Stunning. Disparate animals were built using not just the same kinds of tools, but indeed the very same genes. He goes on to say, the evolutionary lines that led to flies and mice diverged more than 500 million years ago. No biologist, catch this, no biologist had the foggiest notion that such similarities could exist between genes of such different animals. The Hox genes were so important that their sequence had been preserved throughout the enormous span of evolution. Stunning confirmation of the creationist prediction. We're looking for the information 
And when the technology developed, we found the information. The common information for these common designs was right there in the Hox genes. And I'd like you to list, look carefully at that quote. Right at the very end, he makes a quick slip. You know that convergent evolution? It's dumped overboard. That firmly held belief in convergent evolution, completely gone, and now it's replaced with conservation. Now these genes are so important, so important, that they have survived 500 million years unchanged. And what's incredible is some evolutionists say, since we have similar genes as bacteria, some of these genes have survived for three billion years unchanged while the rest of the genetics goes mutating on. Wow. That is a counterintuitive and mystifying explanation. And you know, it's kind of like this. Heads I win, tails you lose. Now my brother did that to me when I was about five years old. He was flipping me for my Easter jelly beans. I wondered why he got every single one of those jelly beans because he was doing the heads I win, tails you lose. That was just about the same time he told me that mom and dad really weren't my parents, but that I was like, I was bought at Goodwill for 50 cents and something <laughs> there. Well, on this particular point, the Bible was right again. Common design information specifies similar design in organisms, and not only were the creationist predictions right, the evolutionary thinking and its prediction based on a consistent view was totally dead wrong. Totally dead wrong on this prediction. And what about that junk DNA? Junk DNA. Well, you know, the Bible says that life is designed, but it also says that the creation is cursed in Genesis chapter 3. So we should expect, this is our prediction, we should expect some degeneration of DNA, but not, but not wholesale junk DNA in your genome. And in fact, we should always search for function as we're doing research. These are two different ways of approaching research. One, your DNA is an incredible bioengineering marvel which should have function throughout it, or two, it's cobbled together slowly by genetic mutations and should be filled up with junk, junk that is shared between different kinds of organisms. Well, creationists look for those origins and functions. Here's a great paper by Jerry Bergman published in the Creation Research Society, which is talking about the origins and genetic function of pseudogenes, genes that were supposedly broken and littering our DNA. We're looking for function for those pseudogenes. The evolutionist says that junk is all that separates us from the chimps. And they think that because you can find these so-called broken genes in your genome that it's evidence for evolution and evidence against intelligent design. In fact, your favorite evolutionist and mine, Richard Dawkins, says the implications of the junk are like this. Pseudogenes, those supposedly broken genes that once did something useful, but are now, have been now been sidelined and are never transcribed or translated. What pseudogenes are useful is for embarrassing creationists, he says. He goes on to say it's a remarkable fact that greater than 95% of our DNA is basically junk and might as well not be there for all the difference it makes. Francis Collins goes on to say even more compelling evidence for common ancestry comes from the study of what are known as ancient repetitive elements, another type of junk. Mammalian genomes are littered with such AREs with roughly 45%, he was asserting, of the human genome made of such genetic flotsam and jetsam. So he thinks it's junk. Of course, he can't really refute the creationist explanation that the evidence, of course, does not prove a common ancestor, even if you found junk, or even if it was functional from a creationist perspective. Such similarities could simply demonstrate that God used successful design principles over and over again. That would be my position. Of course, some might argue that these are actually functional elements. That's what I would say. Placed by the Creator for a good reason, of course. And discounting them as junk DNA just betrays our current level of ignorance. That would be my position. We should look for reasons for this junk DNA. Well, what does science say? Well, 
When Dr. Collins wrote that, there were already published in 2002 at least 13 known functions for those AREs, which he was saying were junk. But two major research projects reported out in 2007 and 2012 looking for functions of that so-called junk DNA, which was not coding for protein, found that. Hidden treasures in junk DNA. And the whole concept of junk DNA was being tossed overboard in paper after paper after paper, which were reporting on these findings. Creationists have reported on these findings. Are pseudogenes broken genes? They're not. And if you want a secular reference, grab this paper by Pint and by Wynn. Pseudogenes are not pseudo anymore. In fact, the New York Times reports on bits of mystery DNA far from junk, and they play a crucial role in your day-to-day -day function in life. And this is what the paper said. The system, though, is stunningly complex. The system of supposedly junk DNA is stunningly complex with many redundancies. It goes on to say just the idea of so many switches in this so-called junk DNA, over four million control switches operating your day-to-day -day function DNA. And it says was well, almost incomprehensible there is also a sort of DNA wiring system that is almost inconceivably intricate. One of the researchers on the Human Genome Project said, it blows my mind to think of this complexity. What kind of complexity? 15 trillion bits of information. And one gram of your DNA would hold more information than 100 billion DVDs. And the evolutionists were completely wrong. They say biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of design. We would say, <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> Scripture is confirmed again. There is no evidence for wholesale junk DNA. What there is evidence for is an incredible designer who is far beyond anything we can even comprehend. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Randy, for that presentation. Uh, I want to make a few uh, comments which will be maybe a bit uh, disorganized here because I've just got to go through uh, some various things that he said, but I want to uh, zero in on a few places where I think that uh, he has misrepresented the way that, uh, that scientists would approach uh, the problem of origins. Uh, it's a very ingenious debating trick to sort of capture the debate by capturing the vocabulary and the definitions. And if we want to define science as something based on observation, testing, and repetition, and eliminate everything that doesn't fit that definition from science, then there are a lot of things that people are being paid to do as professional scientists now uh, that somehow mysteriously fall outside uh, of science. There does not exist a simple boundary between science as practiced by doing observation, testing, and repetition, which is a very important uh, part of science, and science which is done by examining historical episodes. Those two scientific enterprises are actually indistinguishable from each other. I'll give you a very uh, simple example. I mean, when, when you observe the sun, you're actually observing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. So are you doing origin science and studying the past history of the sun, or are you studying the sun? Uh, in fact, if you look at the hand in front of your face, there's a small gap between the time that the light leaves your hand and it hits your eye. Uh, and you are looking back in time a bit. If we go through the universe, we find many interesting things that take us way back in history. We find that when we look at the nearest star system, uh, Alpha Centauri, it took several years for the light to reach us from Alpha Centauri. So are we studying that 
in terms of something which we are observing in the present or are we studying the history uh, of that? Uh, in 1572, Tycho Brahe saw a brand new star in the heavens. It was so bright that it was visible during the day. Now we now know that he saw a supernova, a star that exploded and became so incredibly bright uh, that it was just mystifying uh, to him. Now this was an event which happened millions of years ago. In 1604, Kepler saw a supernova, another event that happened millions of years ago. In 1987, in the southern hemisphere, another supernova was visible. Now supernovas are very rare. Those are the uh, only three that we've had in the last 600 years that you could see from the, north, from, uh, from the Earth. Now, uh, those are unique events. Nobody can build a laboratory to repeat supernovas. Nobody can observe enough of them to say that we are doing repetitive observations on the same phenomena. And yet we have a very well-developed science of supernovas, and when the supernova in 1987 occurred, uh, many, many uh, theoretical ideas that had been developed based on uh, predictions that come from the study of, uh, of particle physics uh, were tested and borne out and validated by the uh, flux of odd particles that stream toward and through the Earth uh, in the wake of that supernova. So uh, when we look back into the past, we do science in exactly the same way that we do uh, in the present. It's just that you can't go back into the past and repeat things. I mean, we can't go back and change the Big Bang into something different and see uh, how things uh, will turn out. We have to e extrapolate based uh, on theory. We can't go back and recreate our solar system and put the Earth in a slightly different spot uh, to see what would happen there. But that doesn't mean that we can't study those things uh, scientifically. Uh, many things that are of great inter interest to us, like volcanoes today, uh, for example. I mean, continental drift is something that occurs. I mean, there's so many things going on on our planet that we cannot create laboratories uh, to test them. So uh, to restrict science to the investigation of things which can be observed, tested, and repeated is to try to place evolution and the Big Bang and the other scientific theories of origins outside history uh, by definition. And I am unaware of any member of the scientific community who would define science in that uh, particular way. Now, a second concern I have about uh, Dr. Glues' presentation uh, is his odd uh, identification of Richard Dawkins and Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton and others as important Christian theologians. Now, these, these are men who want Christianity to go away and to die. And they would like, especially uh, Lewinton and Dawkins, uh, they would like to turn science into a weapon to make Christianity die faster and sooner. So it is in their interest to put a theological interpretation on everything that we know about science that makes that science incompatible with Christianity. So I want to suggest that we should not let these anti-religious uh, atheists uh, do our Christian theology for us. Uh, we should look instead to genuine Christian theologians who are not looking to science to destroy faith, but looking to science as a way to gain a more thorough understanding of God uh, as creator. In uh, my book, Oracles of Science, uh, my co-author and I looked at this tendency of leading culture warriors in the uh, battle for atheism uh, and how they like to sort of fashion science into a philosophical weapon to be used against uh, belief in God and against uh, Christianity in particular. And uh, in all cases, they extrapolate recklessly beyond what the scientific data can support. And uh, in so doing, they become uh, amateur, poorly informed, and I think uh, unhelpful theologians that uh, should be ignored. There is a lot of discussion in this conversation about the so-called uh, normal meaning of Genesis. And 
I just want to make a couple of comments about how the normal meaning of Genesis might not be as simple a concept as we might think. I mean, as Christians, we grow up reading the Bible uh, in English, and without thinking too hard about where it came from, we kind of read it as if it was kind of written sort of for us in our time. We kind of imagine that the language can easily be converted from Hebrew into English and the meaning uh, will stay the same and we won't uh, get confused and so on. Um, but if we look very, very closely at the Genesis account, I, I think we see a lot of things in there that uh, suggest to us that the normal meaning of Genesis uh, may not be what comes so quickly off the page in English translations. So take, for instance, the majestic open, opening line. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, when I was a youngster reading that verse, I had seen episodes of Star Trek and so on, and so I pictured the earth as this nice planet and the heavens as the place where the enterprise was boldly going where no one had gone before uh, and so on, and I thought God created that. Now, the Hebrew terms, however, for the heavens and the earth uh, are actually the exact same terms for the land and the sky. Now, we often think of a handful of dirt as being a handful of earth, and so we still have that meaning. But there is no way that the opening verse in Genesis can possibly be referring to a planet. Nobody thought of the earth as a planet until the 17th century. A, a planet, and this is the literal meaning of the word, is a wandering star. A planet is an object in the heavens moving in an inexplicable and curious way that we can't understand. And the ancient Greeks wondered about the odd motion of Mars and Venus and Jupiter and they called them wandering stars because they didn't move with the rest of the heavenly host. The earth was not a planet because the earth was not in the heavens and was not wandering about. It was fixed and at the center. So uh, to picture the proud round earth with its beautiful blue character and fluffy white clouds suspended in space as the meaning of the first verse in Genesis is to sort of rip that ancient Hebrew concept out of the time in which it was uh, written uh, and put it in a uh, context uh, several thousand years later, uh, which is, I think, a, uh, a very unreasonable disservice uh, to that ancient text. If we read a little bit further in Genesis, we see that God creates a firmament. Now, this word firmament has caused a lot of puzzlement. Now, it turns out that the word that's translated as firmament uh, actually means literally a bowl or a dome. And there are other places in the Old Testament where it talks about a firmament full of oil. Firmament, you know, you can buy, put salad in a firmament. The Hebrew word is rakia, and it means something that can be pounded out into a thin, solid metal shape. And we know from pictures that have come down to us and extra-biblical accounts that this was the view that the uh, ancient Israelites had of the heavens. And they weren't the only ones. Their neighbors shared this view. I mean, everybody thought that there was some kind of an inverted dome overhead. And if you go to a planetarium, I had my students in the planetarium in Boston just a week ago, you can see that if you put a dome over your head and you shine lights on it, it looks exactly like the night sky. So there's a very ordinary everyday observational language being used there that God has placed lights on this dome in the heavens uh, and that's what we see when we look up uh, at night. There are additional clues in the Hebrew meaning of the starring characters in this story, Adam and Eve. I mean, we know people that have these names today so we just think of them as regular ordinary names but uh, I mean, the Hebrew word uh, for Adam is just man. God created man. It's a completely generic term. No one would have been called Adam then. And Eve is 
means the mother of all living, right? So there, there are suggestions here uh, that this is, is a much different kind of story than something which we might get from the normal reading. And I think if we are fair to biblical scholars who have taken the time to help us understand what this means, uh, we recognize that there's a diversity of interpretation here that I think certainly should prevent us from digging in our heels on any uh, particular uh, interpretation uh, of this. Now, uh, I want to suggest that a much better approach to this, rather than suggesting that we must choose between God's truth or man's word, is to use a metaphor that the Christian tradition has used for a thousand years, even longer perhaps, and that is the idea of the two books. Okay, God has given us the book of Scripture, and God has given us the book of nature. Now those have been understood by Christians going back to Thomas Aquinas and earlier, as two distinct and separate revelations, both provided by the same creator, and both that can be brought into harmony with each other. Now, when they're not in harmony, we have work to do. And perhaps the most uh, celebrated historical episode was the one that challenged Galileo, when Galileo had to deal with the fact that it says in Psalm 93 that the earth is fixed and it cannot be moved. The earth is fixed and it cannot be moved. And Galileo was trying to convince people that the earth was not fixed and it did move. And so a question arose as how we bring these two books together. Well, we cannot bring them together by subordinating one book to the other. We have to keep them in conversation with each other, aware that they both have the same author, and seek humbly, prayerfully, and in communion with each other, the very best understanding of both of those books so that we can better understand uh, our Creator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guyberson. First, I'd like to point out that the main reason the evolutionists gave for not, or theistic evolutionists, for not giving Genesis their normal words, their, their normal meaning, and their normal context was because of the supposed factual evidence for evolution, that it was supposedly true. But you're giving my words their normal meaning in their normal context right now. And you're understanding me. You read a newspaper and you give words their normal meaning in their normal context. When, you're, when a husband says to his wife, I love you, she doesn't say, what do you mean by that? Love me like you love mashed potatoes or something like that? No, you give words their normal meaning in their normal context and the only reason why theistic evolutionists say you should not do that with the book of Genesis, particularly the first 11 chapters, is because the scientific evidence for evolution has been so overwhelming that we cannot trust it. That was the reason why I needed to push back against every one of those points on evolution. And you notice I wasn't just saying evolution was wrong. I wasn't just saying evolution was wrong on the origin of life. I was saying the Bible got it right. Life only comes from life. I wasn't saying that evolution was just wrong and saying organisms can change into fundamentally different types. I was saying the Bible got it right. They reproduce after their own kind. Now, if evolution can't get it right on these two basic points, getting life going and getting it to change into a fundamentally different kind, if there is no answer and there is no scientific explanation for that, why should we give it any credibility, any credibility to not give the words of Genesis their normal meaning and their normal context. And listen to that rebuttal that my esteemed colleague had. He had no answer for that, those jumps in the fossil record, no answer for that Cambrian explosion, no answer for the similarity of DNA that was predicted by creationists and not predicted by the evolutionists, no answer for the fact that they were spectacularly wrong, wrong on the junk DNA, and we were right on all of those reasons. For all of these reasons, since they are spectacularly wrong, we should not even listen to their explanation, let alone have it stand in judgment of the book of Genesis chapter 1. My colleague is right. Gould, Dawkins, Luantin, 
They do want to use their evolutionary science as a weapon to kill Christianity. That wasn't my point. My point was this. In their use of evolutionary science to kill Christianity, there's not a dime's worth a difference between their atheistic evolutionary view and the theistic evolutionary view. And so if this one is leading to kill Christianity, as we embrace the theistic evolutionary worldview, we might as well take out a knife and plunge it into our spiritual belly and commit spiritual suicide because you're undermining every major doctrine in the scripture, including the very doctrine of God, which doesn't say that God is the creator, but that the creator of all things is God. And brothers and sisters, it may not happen in your generation, but it will happen in the generation of your children. And that is as certain as sunrise. Now that takes me to another point. He says that the universe shows fantastic design. And he had the, which I would agree with, the Acme Handy Dandy Universe Maker, in which he pointed to how all of the dials were set just right for life. That is the precision that we see in design. And that was not explained in any way by the Big Bang scenario which he laid out for us, which came, came out like a, a magical, fanciful story of which um, elements condense, and then they form the periodic table, and then stars explode, eventually leading into people. What an interesting story. The problem is when it comes to biological reality, you're skipping over huge chunks of biological complexity which is not even touched on and not even explained. And it takes on the whole flavor of the evolutionary story as just one fanciful story after another. And then on top of that, he said, it was a kind of a rhetorical twick, trick to try to define the terms, and particularly my definition that science is based on observation and testing. You know, I don't think that's really a trick. That's the definition that all of us learned as children. That's what makes the operation of science so different is that you can base it on tests and observations. And surely there is a huge difference between taking some fragments of bones that we unearth from the ground and concocting a story about their origins and running real tests like they do in my profession of medicine of double-blind randomized trials which tell you whether things work or they don't huge difference between those two. In fact, it goes right back to one of his evidences that he used in his constructive, that of whale evolution, where he showed ambulocetus and rhodocetus. You realize what that was a remarkable confirmation of? It was a remarkable confirmation of artistic license in those pictures. That's what it was confirming, because those fossils that he's talking about are extremely fragmented with many bones missing of those. And they show all evidence of being land-dwelling creatures. So what we really have are fossils of land-dwelling creatures and real whales, but no real transition in between. You have a story, which is the value of real science based on observation and testing, which can push away on those stories. Then he argued that common design. And he said there's no reason why a god of unlimited power should reutilize designs over and over again. Well, that's just based on that assumption that God wouldn't want to do that. Well, how does he know? Your government seems to have unlimited money, and they use designs over and over and over again in buildings. I mean, why is this unlimited resource of a limiter on that? That's just an unreasonable assumption. He said that the evidence of arms on humans and flippers on, on, on dolphins and bat wings and stuff, they, they don't show evidence of optimal design. I don't know where he got that from because they seem to be working very well and we as human beings are copying their designs to try to optimize our designs. So that explanation doesn't seem to hold water as well. He also said that the theory of evolution predicts shared genes. Well, I already showed in my constructive that that was dead wrong, that the theory before a post-diction was saying that they have diversified and mutated radically between one or the other. He also mentioned that the pseudogenes, but I mentioned that that was actually a spectacularly wrong prediction and that what you actually find in terms of pseudogenes is actually functional information. 
So these supports for evolution are melting away one by one. Web toes and web feet, yes, children are born with those, but that's due to a breakdown of development. And they function in just an incredibly complex way where the hand is formed and under precise information, the, the tissue between these figures self degenerates, leaving your individual digits in your fingers. It's a process which we can't even begin to duplicate as human engineers. And it is a tragedy when they're born with a tail. He mentioned that evolution can explain cruelty, but he didn't really give an explanation. He just kind of said, it's out there. It's there. Well, we know it's there. How do you explain it if you're holding to a God of omnipotence? How do you explain it? Is God really just indifferent or is he impotent? I didn't hear any explanation coming. It's just that it was just a fact of life on that. Then he mentioned that we suffer from bad design, such as your back problems, your knee problems, your varicose veins. <laughs> These aren't problems of bad design. You know what this is a problem of? Getting old. That's what it's a problem of. You're just breaking down on that. And you know this windpipe and the, and the esophagus that you have together? You're all utilizing it now quite well, and it doesn't seem to be a bad design of any mean. And then some theological issues about the image of God and the sinful nature as coming about over long, long periods of time. These are explanations which are so contrary to Scripture, it, to scripture it's unbelievable. And we have no reason not to believe Scripture anymore because all of these evidences for evolution have vanished. You know, the Scripture doesn't say that your sin nature came over a long period of time. It says it was due to a specific event. God said to Adam, the day you eat of it, you will what? Surely die. And he ate of it and he died. In that sinful nature, it says of, in Psalm 51 of David, in sin did my mother conceive me. Not a sinful act of, re of intercourse, but it was sin because of this sinful nature. So there is no reason theologically why we should believe these slow evolutionary accounts. The scriptures give us very clear explanations of how they happened and the only reason in their view for not to believe scripture and not to give words their normal meaning in their normal context is supposed overwhelming evidence for evolution on that. He mentioned that your brain is so mysteriously powerful. Wow, what a great evidence against evolution and for creation. You know, if evolution is just building things for survival of the fittest, it generally stops in their view once you retain enough to survive. Well, think about this. Why is your brain so incredible? Why is it that I could take the functions for you to survive and basically boil them down to a small part of your brain to keep your heart beating and to keep your lungs working and your diaphragm working and all of those things? Why do you have a brain which is not just super designed compared to what you need to live, why is your brain so super, 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 super designed to give you such incredible capacity to think and to hold things? I just read an article on what it's going to take just to map the neurons in your brain. Just to map the neurons in your brain will take over one trillion DVDs full of information. Explain that from an evolutionary perspective. Or is it that you are able to do something which animals cannot do, and that is what the Bible says, that you are able to know and understand God. When it says, not let, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom or the mighty man boast in his bite, but let him that boasts boast in this, that he knows and understands me. And that's what you're able to do with this incredible brain, not invent religion, i.e. inventing God, but to know God in a personal way and to connect with him. And there is no evolutionary explanation why you should have such a phenomenal brain, but it fits perfectly well with the creation explanation. And then finally, the two books of nature. The two books, scripture and nature. Yes, there are books. There is 
scripture, special revelation, knowing about God. There is nature. Romans 1 says this, and this is how we should approach it. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are what? Clearly seen, being understood by the things that he has made. All of these multiple parts functioning together for a purpose, which we only see in human design things, and we only see in all of human experience as a basis of intelligence. These declare him. But you know, there was a problem, which means that we need the second book always to trump human interpretation. Because it says, not only did we see these things, it also says, and is they, and as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the uncorruptible creator made like into an image in all of nature. Brothers and sisters, that's why we need the first book, Scripture, to guide us into truth, because each and every one of us and anybody on this planet has this natural tendency to want to move away from God, and that is why we cannot interpret it correctly without that Scripture, and that is why we always need the Scriptures to guide us into the truth. I would suggest to you, confidently, confidently, Stand up and proclaim this great message of reconciliation of an offended creator with his sinful creatures. There is no scientific reason not to, and we have just shown that every evolutionary prediction was false, one right after the other, but more important, the scriptural declarations were confirmed over and over again. There's no reason not to. Science has been described as a fanciful story. Our theories of origins have been described as having been concocted. Careful predictions about what things might have looked like have been described as nothing more than artistic license. This description of the scientific community is necessary in order for us to be a creationist. We have to believe that the scientific community is populated by frauds, liars, people who are telling a fanciful story and concocting stories with absolutely no evidence because somehow they are hostile to belief in God and don't want uh, us to be accountable for our actions. But this was a view of the scientific community that I accepted as a teenager that I acquired from reading creationist literature. And the reason why I moved away from that position was because as I became a scientist myself, I began to realize that the scientific exercise is one of enormous integrity. Science would not be any fun at all if it was all about concoction and artistry. Science is only fun because it is the search for the truth. And I have known many, many scientists in my life. I would have never known a single one of them to be doing anything that I would call concocting. Okay, they are working diligently, they have to get a lot of education, they're poorly paid, they don't get a lot of fame uh, from their jobs, but it is really fun to look closely and humbly at nature and try to finger, figure out what is true about the world. And the story of origins that we have is a powerful, all-encompassing explanation that has multiple lines of evidence that come together to suggest that the story that I told you tonight is true in outline form, although we are certainly developing better understandings of it. I had answers to the many things that he said I did not. What I did not have was the 45 minutes that it would have taken me to provide uh, those answers. Uh, but there are so many independent lines of evidence that have converged on the same uh, explanation. Now evolution is certainly a complex theory. Things are changing radically. Uh, we can't be quoting uh, geneticists from 1963, as Dr. Galuza did, because this is a field which is in absolutely revolutionary change, even as we speak uh, today. But the scientific community is moving slowly and fitfully and with integrity uh, in the direction that, uh, that I have outlined uh, tonight. And as Christians, we need to embrace that as God's work of creation, not as the uh, concoction of a lot of 
frauds. Well, in Dr. Guyverson's closing statement, he actually brought up a brand new argument that we would believe that scientists are a bunch of frauds and liars, and I wish I could respond to that during my rebuttal. Let me try to take 60 seconds and summarize it. Back in the early 1930s, over 100 years ago, the vast majority of scientists believed that we should purify the human race by eliminating the unfit genes and by saving the fit genes. And people like us who were in the minority were laughed at, marginalized, and ridiculed that we were not scientists, our papers weren't published in journals, and we weren't invited to international conferences. And the vast, vast majority of scientists, the establishment of the day, said that we need to forcibly sterilize human beings. And by 1931, in the United States of America, 31 states had legalized forced sterilization under the scientific guise of eugenics based on what the vast majority of scientists said, and over 70,000 Americans were forcibly sterilized. Now, there's an, there's an obvious answer that scientists can be dreadfully wrong, totally wrong, and the minority view can be completely stamped out. This is the fact, and I just want to speak to you as brothers and sisters in Christ. We went through the evolutionary argument point by point and refuted all of their main lines. We confirmed the scriptures over and over again. And there is a tremendous pressure on Christians today due to a fear of man to try to meld our message with the message of the one that's going to try to kill Christianity. And it is, it is such a tremendous pressure that people really can't hardly resist it. But let me urge you to resist it at all costs. Because the very thing that we would do to gain respect in the eyes of the world is the very thing that will lose our respect in the eyes of the world. You slit your throat by doing such a thing. And you know, brothers and sisters, there is something totally irresistible about a Christian who believes exactly what they say they believe. I'm told of the story of, of Thomas Kuhn, who was a skeptic, listening to George Whitfield preach. And one of his fellow skeptics came up to George Whitfield and pumped him on the shoulder and said, hey, I thought you didn't believe the gospel. And he looked at him and he says, but that man does. Let's be that man.